this season on Kev Fatu. Who is engaging them too? No. Fatu. I am not at liberty to say yes or no. Oli. For us, every day is a new opportunity to make sure our first impressions are always our best and to see possibilities on the horizon, to make our facilities and services more accessible and find freedom all around us. With a location proximity to active markets, with a liberal air transportation policy, that daily pursuit is how we turn everyday opportunities for you. For all destination marketing support, customized packages for new existing airlines and operators and for a highly ranked tourist destination, the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority is here to serve. We regulate air transport, operate and manage BIA technical requirements, merge with commercial considerations. We have experienced and well-trained aviation professionals to cater for your needs. For investment opportunities in building airport hotels, shopping malls, playground for children, do contact us on 4472-831, 4472-893. Gambia Civil Aviation Authority. We go beyond daily. When we touch down, but I broke down. With Gamtel G Fiber, now you can enjoy super fast internet in gigabytes. G Fiber is affordable, stable, secured, and accessible to homes, businesses, and enterprises. With Gamtel G Fiber, the future is speed. Gamtel, creating a brighter future in communication. Can't do small or big projects with the same dedication and commitment as we do. With a reputation as the leading printing company in the country, when it comes to major projects and innovative solutions, we always deliver in high quality, thus receiving the trust and confidence of our clients. From the moment your order is placed to when it is delivered, we believe in exceeding expectations from the sales manager to the production team, the account manager, and the person delivering your material. We have state-of-the-art equipment and a highly experienced and competent workforce that enables us to deliver top quality work on time. At reasonable prices, we provide our clients with multiple solutions right from conceptualizing, designing, printing, binding, publishing, and distribution. For all your printing requirements, we are strategically located at the Sankumsila Highway, the Gambia Printing and Publishing Corporation. We print what you desire. Every young Gambian dream of a university degree. He wants a good paying job after graduation, a pretty wife, and ultimately own a dream home. What if I can't afford my desired dream home? And that is why you need to visit Universal Properties. We specialize in customer satisfaction. We listen to every of our clients' needs when we sold the properties to our client. Before you know it, you hear the client saying, I like this house. This is the room that cuts my heart. And most of the time, they cling to the door never to let go. Most clients want to close the deal right there. And that is why we always have their contracts in the trunk of our cars. We work at our client's pace. No haggle, no hazard. We're waiting for you at our office in Kairaba Avenue here in the Gambia. Hello and welcome to Kirfato. Uh, today's discussion is part of activities marking 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, which commences on the 25th of November to December 10th. The theme of this year's campaign is Orange the Wall, Fund, Respond, Prevent and Collect. In order to raise awareness on, of gender-based violence in the Gambia,
UNFPA seeks to privilege the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence to shed light on the country's response mechanism and what government is doing to eradicate it. And to discuss all of this with me, I have the Honorable Minister of uh, Women's Affairs, Fatu Kinte. Um, Mr. Kule is the resident representative of the UNFPA Gambia. Uh, Lamin Jai is the PRO of the Gambia Police Force. And Alima Tujalo is the program manager, Network Against Gender Violence. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. Communication, connectivity is everything. We ensure that the links never sleep. Quantities and qualities, all in our data service, providing efficient, reliable voice and data service. We believe if you're not up to speed, then you're going backwards. Communications have to flow as fast as the speed of light. Whatever business you're in, having someone who understands your needs is critical. That is why we just don't offer you technology, we offer you solutions. Enjoy Gamsel's internet broadband anytime, anywhere. Your national operator, Gamsel Yaibarom. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, the 16 days um, of activism against gender-based violence, which commences on the 16th, uh, 25th of uh, the November to December 10th. Honorable Minister, give us an overview as to uh, the situation of gender-based in the Gambia. Thank you very much, um, which, um, thank you very much, uh, Fatu. Um, I want to start by saying that um, today is the 25th of November and it is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And the 10th of December is Human Rights Day. Hmm. So the period from 25th December, November to 10th December is internationally recognized as it, the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. Um, we are aware that um, gender-based violence um, is very common in our culture, in, in, in our tradition, in our communities. Mm -hmm. uh, many a time, people misinterpret it to be a religious practice. Yeah. But then, all what is clear is that gender-based violence is a social norm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is in different forms. Um, there is physical, psychological, and sexual. Um, and there is also economic violence. Yeah. Um, um, sexual violence is rape, and uh, uh, domestic violence, uh, which includes um, battery, mm -hmm. um, and uh, psychological violence is when you um, uh, uh, malice your partner, you don't talk to your partner for a long time, that can cause psychological violence. Mm -hmm. And economic violence, um, in the Gambia and in most developing countries, women rely on their spouses for financial support. Yeah. When a man denies uh, the woman that support, that can also contribute towards economic violence. Yeah. And also, um, sexual violence also uh, is not only rape, but where a man denies the woman sexual services in bed, that mm. can also be considered as sexual violence. Mm. And uh, all these forms of violence are happening in the Gambia. There's also sexual harassment. Um, you make certain remarks towards a lady because of the way she's dressed, that is sexual violence, that's sexual harassment. And sometimes, even where she's not dressed in a very in an awkward manner, even when she's properly dressed, if you make certain comments, certain comments, it's, it's referred to as sexual harassment. Yes. And uh, over the years, a lot has been happening in the Gambia, and uh, um, the government is aware that um, sexual there is sexual there is domestic there is uh, gender based violence, mm -hmm. and uh, government of the Gambia um, has joined the rest of the world in signing and harmonizing and, 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 and domesticating the uh, uh, International Convention on the Rights of, on the, on the, rights of the Child mm -hmm. and also the Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Yeah. And, um, and we didn't only stop at that, but uh, the commitment made in signing those uh, documents has been put into action. And as a result, um, as we are speaking, we have legislation against uh, gender based violence. There is the Domestic Violence Act 2013. There is also the Sexual Offences Act of 2013. There is the um, the Children's Act Amendment 2016, and then there is also the Women's Act amended in 2015. Mm -hmm. And as we are speaking, um, the Domestic Violence Act 
and the uh, Women's Act are being further amended to take into consideration emerging issues. And uh, that means uh, uh, with these acts, these are laws in place. Mm -hmm. So if uh, one is found wanting, you will face the consequences of the law. And uh, uh, we have gone ahead and done a lot of sensitization um, uh, in terms of popularizing these laws so that people become aware of the existence of the laws. And then they become aware also that if you are found wanting, you face the consequences. So I want to come there, Honorable, because um, you have spoken about legislation, you have spoken about uh, Gambia joining the rest of the world in joining uh, ratifying conventions and all this. I have said this several times. Gambia, we are not sort of laws. We have laws on child, children's issues, women issues, mm -hmm. but enforcement becomes the issue. Yeah. Enforcement becomes the issue. Recently, we have seen the, the the rise in cases of rape. We have seen nude pictures being exposed on social media. What is government specifically doing to address the rise and also uh, prosecuting people who are found wanting? Okay. Um. In the case of rape, mm -hmm. um, when a case is reported yeah. uh, to the police, of course. Um, the perpetrator is the suspect is arrested, mm -hmm. and then uh, um, after investigations, if um, the person is found guilty, he is prosecuted. Okay. Um, a case in point recently, there was a case in one of the schools. I don't want to name the school. Yeah. And then um, the teacher raped the, the girl, and then now that teacher is um, uh, has been sentenced to fifteen years of imprisonment. Fifteen years imprisonment. Mm -hmm. uh, remember, um, with cases of gender-based violence, especially the rape, it's difficult if the evidence is lost. Yeah, many a time, mothers and the parents and the guardians or members of the family will clean the victim before going to the police. Mm -hmm. When you clean the victim and you go to the police, then there's no evidence. If there's no evidence, it will be difficult to have a case against the so-called perpetrator. But once there is evidence, the perpetrator faces the consequences of the law. And there were times here, I remember some years back, um, there was another man in the rural areas who was sentenced to 15, 14 years imprisonment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this year, just recently, somebody has been imprisoned 14, for 14 years. Okay, coming to other forms of gender-based violence, the problem here is that um, sometimes people just sweep it under the carpet and they, they don't report. Yeah. And uh, um, as a result of that, um, um, with support from the NFPA, um, uh, there has been training of the police officers. First of all, um, gender-based violence and gender has been integrated into the curriculum of the train, police training school and a gender unit established at the police training school. And uh, uh, training manuals have been developed. And uh, as we are speaking, over a thousand five hundred police officers have been trained on gender and gender based violence and how to manage the cases. And the police themselves also organize uh, panel discussions to further sensitize the community on gender and gender based violence and the role of the police. As a result, now we are seeing more and more cases being reported to the police. And once the cases are reported, but uh, uh, the issue of prosecution is the problem. But that also is, the, uh, is because the, um, um, uh, the families who are involved withdraw the cases from the police. Yeah. And once they withdraw the cases for, from the police, to pursue the case becomes a problem. But then the police don't stop at that. Um, we have sensitized them to make sure that they visit the families and do further sensitization on gender-based violence so that those family members will be aware that certain acts are acts of gender-based violence and it should, it should not be repeated. But uh, what, what, one thing I've been saying all, all along is that I think the police should allow them to be doing the cases. That's right. If we are able to prosecute one or two, I'm sure we'll see a big change. So, Kule, you, um, you and FPA have been working with government and CSOs to help address um, the issues of gender-based violence. How do you work with these agencies, the police and government, and of course um, the network of gender-based violence, to make sure uh, gender-based violence and other harmful practices are addressed properly in the country? Um, thank you so much, Fatu. Very good question, and thanks for having me on the, on the program. Mm -hmm. um, good question again. You have brought me to brought me on a panel with my bosses that we all, <laughs> that we all work with and mm -hmm. I think the Honorable Minister has set the tone by you know bringing I think in our conversation she you know she linked us all together yeah uh, let me say just to reiterate that the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence you know it's a, it's an international movement that mm -hmm. the Gambia is joining yeah. this movement started about 30 years ago at um, Rutgers University where females NGOs, you know, came together during the Women Global Leadership Institute and decided that for 16 days, starting on the International Days to end gender-based violence, to the Human Rights Day. Along that day, there are many pathways, World Days Day, you know, that that addresses this issue. 
Uh, the minister has been very clear. UNFPA as an agency, we have three strategic missions, and gender-based violence is one of them, and it's to eliminate all forms of gender-based violence. In Abaddon, there are 150 countries where we're currently active um, in the country. Now, to address the specific question, if you look at the theme of this year's um, uh, 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 commemoration, mm -hmm. it is Orange the World. Yeah. Fund. Yeah, prevent, respond, and collect. Mm -hmm. collect yeah. Now, these three, these four areas, is the way we work with everybody here. Okay. Funding, for example, we advocate with government to put its money where its mouth is. We also support government by funding programs like the the honourable minister has spoken about. Mm -hmm. As I speak with you, where we support the police, we support the Ministry of Women Affairs, we support the NGBV uh, financially, technically, you know, to respond to, to different areas of gender-based violence. And I can elucidate on that if you, if yeah. you, if you, if you do wish. Um, so funding also goes to the other part. So funding is the first one, but how do you prevent gender-based violence without funding? Mm. One, you need to do behavioral change communication, which is key to in communities. The minister has rightly said um, gender-based violence, whether we like it or not, is rooted in inequality of men and women yeah. in our society. And it's not only in Gambia. It's nothing we should be ashamed of talking about. Yeah. In every part of the world, you know, gender-based violence exists. And it's, it's rooted. Mm -hmm. It finds its foundation in the inequalities of, uh, you know, when, uh, amongst them. Um, genders and you can take it back to time of physical strength to that led to economic strength like the minister has said and so many things like that so now what do we do we fund programs to al allow people to understand that you know we need to come together to develop the gambia that's one yeah. number one you cannot be you know unfair in a make out to 50 percent of your population and think you're going to develop you know so the, this issue of keeping the girl child out of school not inviting the girl child you know uh, as I speak to you, the last survey that was taken indicates that uh, 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 about 60% of Gambian women, you know, at some point felt it was okay for their spouses or their partner to hit them. them. You know, so these are things that it's not only for the, for the men, it's for all of us to educate ourselves, yes. you know, for the men, the women, the girl child, yeah. and the male child to respect girls, even from the time is in grade four or grade five. And these are conversations we have to have. Community level, religious leaders, we need to have this conversation. So that's about a first part of funding. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think about prevention. Prevention is a lot. It's a whole gamut of a social issue. Now, we speak about response. Mm. I want to commend, you know, the gender -based, uh, network on gender-based violence for the good work they've done in responding. Now, how do you respond? So when violence has already happened, Mm -hmm. You need to take care, you know, of the victim. And I use the word victim very carefully because we victimize people in different ways. Yes. From opening our mouth, snide remarks, which leads to a lot of mental and psychosocial issues, mm -hmm. to the physical abuse, which starts from beating someone in the house yes. and turning them to punching bags, yeah. you know, to rape, you know, to harassment. And we know in the Gambia we've seen in recent time, the last year or two, yeah. these issues come to fore. Mm -hmm. You know, we're happy that these issues have, you know, come to mm -hmm. fore and we are dealing with it at different levels. Like the minister said, you know, it would not happen in a day though. Mm -hmm. However, it's time to have the conversation. So what do we do? We're supporting um, the different partners that have to respond. So for example, the health centers have to be able to look after the physical needs of a victim of, uh, of gender-based violence. And with NGBV, been, even before we came you know, into it directly, they were working with one, what we call one-stop centers, mm. where in health facilities, we bring together the healthcare provider, psychosocial you know, provider, even the police can have you know, a room there to collect data mm -hmm. and information, and the justice system can also come you know, as part of you know, response. So that is responding mm -hmm. and i'll just be quick to just move to yeah. uh, the issue of um uh, uh, of collecting data data is very key mm -hmm. you know however data must be collected in a way that is responsible mm -hmm. and does not compromise the confidentiality of the victim of the woman so it has to be survivor um, survivor centered however the minister should be able to walk into the national assembly 
and say we need funds for these things because this is happening in our country. Yeah. You cannot be denying that this is happening. You know, it's important for her to have you know information correct because they was God, this is not happening here, mm -hmm. this is not happening here. She needs to be able to say, while I will not give you the details. In Badibu, this happened at this yeah. time. Mm -hmm. You know, in uh, I'm not calling Badibu just because <laughs> but in Basi, this yeah. happened. Mm -hmm. In Banjo, this happened. In Serekunda, this yeah. happened. And I'm telling you, air based violence happened Everything. all over the land. Let's yeah. not. It's not. It's, it's not all over. over yeah. It's all over the land. So, mm -hmm. so these are very important. You know, I, I, with our sister against the UNDP, we work with the ministry. You know, to have a gender management information system, which you know we hope, and the police is also very involved. You know, to support this. The minister has spoken a lot about working with the police, mm -hmm. and that's another area that we need to continue to intensify. Yeah. The police must, mu and I insist must, I'm not the leader of the police, yeah. but I'm passionate about it, yeah. must know that this is a major issue that would, you know, that will compromise the security of the nation if it's not put, uh, uh, adequately dealt with. And the only way they can do that is to respond um, rape is a crime. Families cannot withdraw rape. rape. And, yeah. and I'm sure you, you will say it at some point. Yeah. But we understand our social cultural dynamics. Mm -hmm. we're, we're so I know those issues. I'm not, yeah. I'm not oblivious of that. But we need to continue to work you know, along that way. The final thing I would say is that justice response system. Uh, courts and magistrates and everything must be willing and ready to hear this, these cases and not shy away from it. And even though the idea is not to put Gambians in prison, but we're hoping that that kind of response will be a deterrent. If you know that if you do this, you're not going to get away from it. You will not stop a girl walking on the streets in your, in your area, pull her into a room and violate her. It is no man's right to violate a woman or a girl. And we must work together to stop that in the Gambia. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, so, Lamy, the, the law enforcement is an integral part of um, eradicating the gender-based violence in the country. And many a times, myself and so many other people have called out the police for the way they handle these cases. What is the police doing in strengthening the relationship between victims or survivors and, and communities as well. Because most of the time, w the experience we get from most of the people that come to report to police stations is even the environment, when you take their, their, their statements. Who is there? How do you record these statements? That is important. And that is, this is the reason why so many survivors are going back without coming back to the police again, because right. they don't feel welcome at many a time. So what is the police doing in addressing that? Uh, very well. Thank you very much to all the panelists and thanks for having me in this very important forum. Um, like you have said, it is a very um, great concern for the Gambia Police Force, especially um, in issues relating to gender-based violence as we speak. Um, this is why um, it's not just about the pandemic, but gender-based violence has always been present. But we have done some um, observation also. Um, we've realized that there is a steady increase in the number uh, in the um, number of violent cases against women reported to the police at different police stations because we also collect data of reports of crimes that come to us. And so we have realized that um, there is a steady increase in violence against women and girls, especially during this period of lockdown and stay at home and all that. And so um, because of that concern, we could not sit down and look at this trend continue. And so we've decided to um, sort partnership with organizations and um, 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 uh, NGOs that also operates within the context of gender-based violence. And that's why we found our way partnering with the Paradise Foundation to be able to um, partner into uh, coming up with activities that will include educating police officers who handle these cases, like you mentioned, so that they know what sort of uh, issue they are dealing with instead of trivializing. Because like you have said, gender-based violence is some kind of cultural norm within yeah. our society somehow. And police officers also come from the same society yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So therefore, it is important that they are being capacitized in the way they understand the issue itself. So that when you understand an issue very well, then you will attach that value, that sort of um, seriousness in the way you deal with it. And that's why we are very um, grateful to the UNFPA and the Ministry of Women's Affairs and all the other partners who are supporting the police in capacitizing 
police officers. Uh, not only that, some few weeks ago we have launched um, through this um, partnership with the Paradise Foundation, we have launched the um, police gender-based violence response campaign at um, Bansam. Um, this is geared towards rolling out the idea of having police officers taking up gender-based violence as a very serious matter. We have trained police officers and also we have an interface with the community of Bansang. Many other communities within the area of Bansang were at the um, forum and we have discussed openly the issue of gender-based violence and what women can do in time, um, in time to um, see to it that the secret dress, especially see that police intervention is um, 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 sought when situations like this happen. Now I want to say this because it's important for us to also admit that um, the fact that gender-based violence is a cultural issue, there is need for community members also yeah. to be very, very well um, sensitized. Mm -hmm. And so especially that's why our target is to deal with communities regarding the issue about um, um, the constraints that we face mm -hmm. as a police department in investigating cases of gender-based violence. So we are uh, sending messages out regarding some few challenges. For example, when it comes to, um, the Honorable Minister have said here, the destruction of evidence. Mm. Communities, this gender-based violence issues, especially sexual violence happens, and uh, uh, sexual and or rape issues happen. Without their knowledge, somehow, some way, they destroy evidence and at the end of the day, it hamper the um, uh, um, progress of this um, matter in court. And so we try to send messages across to see that community members, especially women, are very well sensitized in terms of protecting evidence. Now, the other constraint that usually the police will face in dealing with these situations is got to do with um, reporting time. They delay a lot in reporting mm -hmm. um, uh, so because most of the time they try to negotiate the mm -hmm. issues among themselves. Yeah. So when negotiations fail within the community and another party is not satisfied, then perhaps that's the time they will get to the police. And so you will realize that sometimes the time that they have taken also affects the uh, way the matter will be handled in the police because so many other facts you want to collect are already being um, tampered with. And the other thing is the issue of witnessing. You know, um, if you want to prosecute somebody, you have yeah. to have witnesses yes. that will come forward and testify. And so um, you mentioned the issue and he also said it that um, gender-based violence cases should not be withdrawn from the police. Yes. Yeah. Normally, when, even when the police uh, insist on not withdrawing, but they go to deal with the witnesses, and so the witnesses will be reluctant to come forward mm -hmm. to testify at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. we want to give this information out so they understand the importance of coming forward to serve as a witness. Because um, if you have a witness in a case, you are relying on the person's evidence in court to be able to um, uh, diligently prosecute. Yeah. And so if they fail to come, which usually will happen, of course the law has given the police the power. Even if a witness refuses to come, you can f bring the witness as a hostile or subpoena the witness. But you don't want to um, um, be hostile to a witness who is supposed to even lay foundation for you in a case. And so that's still not positive when it comes to um, the prosecution of this case. So these were some of the concerns and the issues and challenges that the police is having. And we feel now it is good that we go out and talk to communities about this so the more their awareness is raised probably will have less and less issues when it comes to diligently prosecuting cases of gender-based So, but how, how equip our police stations across the country? Mm -hmm. uh, do we have gender-based units in every police station? Because if you go to my village in Badibu and, um, oh. people, want <laughs> <laughs> and people want to report cases, um, is the facility available there? Um, facility is something. And capacity. But let me say this. Um, the Gambia Police Force at the command level, we mm -hmm. have been, uh, it has been a very um, um, crucial issue, especially, very important, and the police is definitely concerned about gender based violence, which is why a while ago, um, some time ago, they have created the Gender and Child Welfare Unit within the police force. Um, the Gender and Child Welfare Unit is specifically responsible to investigate cases of gender based violence and related issues of crime against 
against women and children. And so the gender-based violence, um, the Gender and Child Welfare Unit has its headquarters or its uh, main office at Banjul, yeah. but they also have offices all across at police stations. Yeah. So they have officers, investigators who are um, plain clothed officers. They are not in uniform for the fact that they should be able to easily relate with um, survivors or victims of gender-based violence and related offenses. So they are, we have them posted at all police stations, um, perhaps not all, but mainly all, most of the main police stations that you have across the country, they have gender and child welfare officers. And we are working hard to see that they are trained in social work and uh, related fields so that they will be able to provide the initial psychosocial support for victims as well as diligently investigate um, cases so that perpetrators can face justice. Thank you very much. Alimutu, so tell us uh, how I know Jan, your, your agency is doing a tremendous job in helping um, victims, especially uh, in psychosocial support, legal aid. How do you work with survivors in, in, in these areas? Thank you very much, Fatou. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for having me. How soon will you be aware the network against gender-based violence is a membership-based organization. Mm -hmm. And our main aim is to eliminate all forms of um, gender-based violence. Um, we work with survivors because we believe that we have created a platform for them to come to us. And through um, working with them, we have formed what we call a survivor group, where um, we train them and we um, we work with them to be um, agents of change and become advocates. And um, doing that, we normally take their stories with their permi permission on the informed consent and confidentiality. And we also um, create forum for them to meet with their counterparts where we offer them basic counseling, counseling skills um, also on, on positive living. And also we do provide um, services for them in, in the case of incest, especially incest when it comes to sexual um, violence. We have a lot of incest cases um, that do we deal with them and most of them um, if they have delivered safely and after breastfeeding and they are willing to go back to school, we do work with the Ministry of Education to provide integration for them to back, go back to their formal schools. And also we support them in terms of providing uniforms and other basic needs for them to be really integrated. We do also offer them skills like um, um, basic skills, for example, if they are interested in um, how to call it large skills that we can be able to provide through our partners and our members, we do also offer that to them. Um, also we do offer them um, some kind of trainings and we do also go with them in so most of our meetings that we hold for them to be willing, if they are willing to talk about positive living, we do use them. For example, through our partnership with UNFPA for the first time this year, we have been able to um, train them on basic interactive theater skills. And we are hoping that we are going to use them during the 16 days activism to f perform basic dramas and giving out uh, messages on SDVB. So they are quite an active group. And also um, in terms of advocacy and lobbying, we are advocating for policy change and popularizing the laws against gender-based violence across the country. In terms of comprehensive care and support services, um, the, the Honorable Minister and also Mr. Kunle have also talked about the one-stop center. The aim of the one-stop center um, so is to offer comprehensive services to survivors within health facilities. Um, because one of the greatest challenges that survivors face is going from one um, service to another, and that um, re-traumatize them in uh, recounting their stories every time with every member. So the main um, aim of the one-stop center is for the survivor to access the one-stop center, which is in most of the hospitals now and in the major health facilities and um, with sponsorships, partnering with the UNFPA and other donors and the government. We have been able to, we are, we, we are in three and currently we have started operating in six additional hospitals. The main idea is the survivor access the one-stop center, you'll be able to have medical care and then you'll be able to have um, psychosocial support in terms of counseling, force aid management, and we'll also want to um, refer you, link you. Ideally, we should have a room in the hospital where the, the gender welfare officer would sit. But currently we're having challenge with that because um, another major challenge is capacity in terms of um, the people that are working both in the health facilities and in the police. Mm -hmm. So for us to have a gender welfare officer sitting at the one-stop center is quite challenging. So what we do is um, we link with them when we have a survivor and they will actually come and assess the client and then if they need investigation because it's based on informed consent, even though we know that sexual violence is mandatory reporting, uh, especially the rape, 
some survivors may not want to go to the police because of the, the gender norms. We al already talked about that um, the culture of silence, the gender norm, and it's a major deterrent to reporting of cases. But we do have that, and we and through the one stop center also, we can refer them for um, legal counseling and legal aid. But legal aid only comes if after the state have already given a verdict and they are not happy on it. Uh, we, they can come to the office and we will offer a legal counseling through our partners we've got a little funding where we have a legal um, can, um, a legal person who normally um, offers support to them so that also is available with our partners and we can also walk through the um, the one-stop center to also give them so, um, social services and through the same ENFE funding we are grateful that they have been able to appoint social workers for us because that was also a major challenge Though we are working with the Ministry of Women under the Department of Social Welfare, but the same capacity issues for them to get a social worker when they are needed, we always refer, and sometimes it's difficult. And they are also a very good partner that refers so many cases to us for psychosocial support. But currently, we've got um, at least six social workers that have been uh, appointed through the NFPA, and we have already posted them. We hope that they'll be taking most of the social services so that when the client comes, he doesn't need to go to the police, go to the lawyer, go. She would be the main liaison. We call her the case manager in the one-stop center, and we believe that that will um, reduce. So in a nutshell, these are the services that we are offering um, as, as a network. And the other one is um, just to continue the advocacy. And also, um, you, you were talking about um, bullying in the social media. We are also trying to use our um, social media handles mm. to talk about, about this, what they call is it cyber bullying or whatnot. Mm -hmm. We also want to use our social height handle, especially during the 16 days of activism, to be able to um, do that. Also, we are looking at during this activism, we talked about laws. Um, we are particular about the ILO convention to see how best we can advocate for policymakers and decision makers to ratify it so that all institutions would actually have a workplace policy um, to yeah. end, um, yeah. how to call it, um, gender-based violence within. Yeah. And we are not only targeting the decision maker, we also want to target the grassroots um, communities because, um, like Mr. Kunli said, um, it happens in the community and it has to be a BCC behavioral change. And we know that um, gender norm in this country is that women should be silent, yeah. women should not report uh any 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 person if a child report the person becomes a liar that's the myth and therefore that makes them that makes them to be very um timid very early and when they grow up like that they will not be able to discuss sexuality and they will, they will not become able to come out and report when they are violated so we think that um going back to the family unit that is where we need to talk about sexuality issues let them grow with it as children and as they grow to young um, adolescents and teenagers and, and become responsible ad adults in terms of negotiating sex and sexuality. If not we, not, we will not be able to break the culture of silence, which is at the family level. So as a network, we believe that by engaging our members um, and through partnership, we, should, we will be able to engage and, um, throughout the country to be able to sustain that gain because it's not at le one level, it's at all levels, from mm -hmm. the policy level to the grassroots. Are you thinking of owning your dream homes? EJ Investment is here for you. Secure our quality bungalows with two, three, or four bedrooms. Or our story buildings, three or four to five bedrooms at very affordable prices with flexible payment plans. At our Sanyang Sea View Estate, where you can enjoy the cool breeze with modern infrastructure such as the roads, covered drainage system, modern electrification with street lights, gated entrance with security posts and social amenities such as gas station, shopping mall, medical clinic, park, schools, children daycare and a lot more. Our dedicated team of professionals will keep the estate clean at all times, provide security and patrol team within the estate premises, install latest technologies such as CCTV, Wi-Fi, home network installation, solar panel and power backup system. Also, check out for our additional home facilities and interior design service, such as premium tiling, wall plaster, home landscape, fingerprint home lock, 
and a lot more. Visit our office at Senegambia Kololi Highway and get a free site visit tour or contact us on 4464-838. WhatsApp us on 3259220 or you can visit our Facebook page or Instagram on EJ Investments. EJ Investments, we are first in properties. I'm going to go to the house. i Wow. I'm not Lumugatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatagatag
a lot is going on in terms of sensitization, creating awareness so that we can eventually get the behavior change that we look forward to. Um, when it comes to those who report the cases and other things done, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think it's, it's high time we prosecute one or two. Yeah. Once that is done, it will set an example and it will be a deterrent for others to um, violate women and children's, children's rights. Mm. And uh, um, this sensitization covers everybody. It has been going for quite a long time. Yeah. Um, for, uh, the audience uh, constitute uh, women, men, um, uh, influential leaders, religious leaders, traditional leaders, young people. And in fact, the issue of young people is that uh, now we are seeing a lot of young people's NGOs coming up. Yeah. And they are also engaged in sensitizing their fellow young people. Mm -hmm. That's important. But maybe for the adults, it will be difficult to change their mindsets yeah. the way we want it. We can we can change to some extent, but it will be difficult to change it the way we want it. But I believe we we focus a lot also on the young people. Let them know that if you do X and Y, it's considered as a case of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. And there are laws against that. And you may be prosecuted. You will be prosecuted. That way, they'll also learn to respect the girls. They'll respect, learn to respect their sisters. They'll learn to respect their colleagues in school. Mm -hmm. And they will not utter certain, uh, certain words towards them. Yeah. They will not raise a hand against them. Uh, this issue of um, gender inequality, uh, the young people are also trained on gender issues. So they know that the girls, they are at par with the girls. Mm -hmm. So the issue of gender inequality, they shouldn't be thinking about those things. So they should respect the girls, know that the girls also have the right. Mm -hmm. So that way, I'm sure we can also contribute in a big way towards changing these social norms that we have in place. I'm not saying that we'll leave out the elderly people, but, but of course, we'll try to focus more also on the young people so that we further develop them, groom them, to be more responsible people who have respect for themselves and respect um, the guys that they work with and also respect the, the communities. That's one thing. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm, 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 as I have been saying, I think the, uh, with the police, we have to be really firm in our work yeah. and make sure that at least we prosecute one or two. Yeah. Where ev evidence is lost when it comes to rape. Mm -hmm. But when, when it comes to battery, yep. whether you clean or not, the evidence is still there. It's still there. It's still there. Yeah. So we can use that evidence yeah. that to prosecute. Yes, uh, we need witnesses, uh, but in some of these cases, when a, wo a, a woman or a girl is beaten, I don't think you really need evidence, need evidence in that. Nope. The evidence on the skin, uh, on the body of the child, yeah. is enough. Um, it may be enough. I'm a police officer. Yeah. It may be enough <laughs> to uh, prosecute. Yeah. Yes. And I also want to say that um, 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 in the Gambia, um, one of the things we are also doing, um, when a case is reported to the police, the police immediately uh, take action and then um, uh, uh, and, and the, the suspect, suspect yeah. is arrested mm -hmm. until he or she is considered a perpetrator. Yeah. And uh, we have also gone further um, in training nurses mm -hmm. in clinical management of GBB issues across the country, so that when cases uh, uh, cases reach the police, uh, the police uh, the, when the, the police file into the health center, the nurses can also uh, be able to uh, uh, manage the cases. Although we are trying to cut down on the time spent between the police, the nurses, and the uh, lawyers uh, by working closely with the network against the abuse violence and ha by having the, um, the shelters in the health facilities mm -hmm. where everybody will be available. So when a victim arrives, um, then everybody comes in and they give, it requires support. And, uh, we, um, uh, we are also um, at the um, shelter for children in Bakote. Mm -hmm. We also provide um, psychosocial support. Yeah, for victims of gender abuse violence. Mm -hmm. uh, although um, victims only get there when they call the hotline 1313, um, which is manned by the Paradise Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, Paradise Foundation has a shelter at Pipeline, and then the, the government shelter, uh, we are use, currently using the children's shelter at Bakote. So when you call 1313, you are referred to those shelters. And then upon arrival, uh, you have staff who will provide you with psychosocial uh, counseling, psychosocial support. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the shelter in Barquote, um, it has a 24-hour service. Um, social workers are there who can provide psychosocial support. And if it requires um, the person spending the night, there is some space for now where the person can spend the night. Although work is on expanding the, uh, the shelter, so you have, you have bigger accommodation, accommodation which is meant only for victims of gender-based violence. And that will require us to work with donors and other partners um, to make sure that these facilities exist. So um, when um, 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 uh, 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 victims call, or some people call 1313, um, the victim can be referred to these shelters.
So who is the first person um, you contact when you, um, if somebody's abused at home, either you're beaten by your spouse, you who's call, the first person you contact? You can call 1313. Okay. Yes, 1313 okay. three is a free hotline. Okay. We just launched in July. Mm -hmm. We support from UNFPA. And it's managed at the moment by Fathers Foundation. When you call that number, you'll be advised as to where to go. If you ha can't move uh, uh, to, to the shelter, or uh, the, the, the shelter at Vark or the shelter at Pipeline, um, you'll be um, referred at a particular place where the driver can quickly pick you and then take you to the shelters either at Pipeline or the one at Vark But 1313 is available and it's, a free, and, and, and it's free. I also want to say that there's also the 199 hotline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was a children's hot, um, hotline, but was also launched in July this year. Mm -hmm. So if you call either 199 or 1313, you'll be sure that um, you'll be rescued. And whatever support is given to you, um, will be given to you in confidence. So um, uh, uh, the people who are there are well trained, so you can rely on them to report or, or narrate your cases, and they'll give you the required support. You want to come there? Okay, thank you. Um, I think the minister has been very, you know, very clear mm -hmm. on the on on this process. It's and she's very right. I don't like to, you know, have an intervention to the question you asked. Yeah. So the GB, you ask, who do you call? Mm -hmm. The GBV re, uh, referral pathway must have multiple entries, mm -hmm. you know, because if somebody is abused, you don't know, you know, the first point. Yeah. The, the hotline that you spoke about is the first for gender-based violence in the country. Mm -hmm. Online services are very much encouraged globally as they are always quick, rapid response. Almost and telephone penetration is deep in the Gambia. So most people can pick up a phone mm -hmm. and use the toll-free number. So fantastic. And she's uh, and we're proud to be associated with that as well. Mm -hmm. However, if the police is the next person mm -hmm. that the person sees, the woman should be able to approach the police, okay. right? And they understand that they form that what I call referral pathway. Yeah. If it's um, an NGO that is working on gender-based violence, they can also, you know, go there. If it's a health facility, mm -hmm. you know, some of these people have, have um, um, one-stop center, like I said. Yeah. They should be able to attend to, to the individual at the first point of call. So it's a multi-entry point approach. However, it's cyclical. It's still the same, you know, you know uh, elements that form that GBV referral pathway. So the easiest one, like, like the minister has said, that we see is to pick up a phone from the safety of your home. You know, it might even be during the perpetration of that act. You run into a room, you make that call. That's the, the most, you know, seemingly most, you know, accessible, mm -hmm. which is important. But we also want our women and girls to know that, you know, you should be able to approach a police station if that's the easiest you find. Approach a women NGO. They very soon are going to come out with a list on the um, you know, pub, and we'll give it to you. You also help us yeah. on your show and your platforms, you know, to disseminate this kind of information. You know, I think they're developing a pocket guide on the GBV general violence referral pathway, whereby the entry point, if you go to this health center, this is where you should go. They will attend to you. If you go to this uh, uh, um, police station, they will attend to you. If you go to a network or a network affiliated organization. They can attend to you even if you even if you choose yeah. to walk to the gate of the minister's office mm -hmm. somebody should be able to you say to, to, to say you. somebody should be able to say mm -hmm. yeah this is the okay welcome okay this is where you would now go you know so it's it's always a referral point mm -hmm. that that's what i wanted to say you know about that but just to also also quickly say that um i never felt the opportunity to to say that gender-based violence again it is something that is with us mm -hmm. and no matter what we do yeah. the change must also come from the individual yeah you know the change must come from the individual in this country i've been very encouraged in my four years there the people i've met i've seen people change position clearly just because of information and education and the knowledge yeah. they have many people did not have you know that knowledge Lamin, for example, is here. I would say that I have, I have watched him become a fantastic <laughs> advocate of, of gender. I, I'm sure Alima can say, can say this. I have watched him become a fantastic. And it's not like it wasn't, you know, yeah. but you see that yeah. we need yeah. to take an, an, make an effort to understand that we are, if we are not mothers, we're sisters, mm. we're fathers, we're brothers, we're, we're you know, we're friends. Yeah. And 
One thing that really hurts me is the cyberbullying I see on Facebook and other platforms when, you know, these issues come up. Yeah. You hear an issue about uh, a survivor mm -hmm. of victim. And then it seems like there is a general approach yeah. of an attack on that individual. It is not fair. Yeah. It's important that we try to understand. If you don't know, the least you can do is keep quiet. Yeah. You know, the, the least you can do is keep quiet. But when we go after people on basis of limited knowledge or no knowledge at all around this, because you mentioned about video and I know we didn't yeah. speak about, it's a very very difficult thing and i'm not a woman i'm not a girl but if you notice the cases of femicides yeah. in in many of the and also people there but also people take their lives sometimes because of this kind of thing because when the state fails you when your community fails you yeah. when your family fails you when your friends fail you yeah. i do not know where else a 16 17 18 year old will turn to so on this day, I'm using it to just break out that we need to all educate ourselves. It's, and it's a personal choice to know more about gender-based violence with the minister at the leadership of this process. And my partners here they will continue to support this effort and to, to reach out that you know, we get rid of this, this, this pandemic because GBV itself is a pandemic. pandemic yeah. you know, it, we call it the parallel pandemic. As Lamin said, with the rises in COVID cases, the lockdowns. You know, many people are not used to staying at yeah, home. Yeah, I was gonna. Yes, many people are not used to yeah. staying at home with mm -hmm. people and everything. But yeah. you know, and the stress even on demand. You know, so much you're not going out to make a living. Yeah. it can be very difficult. The cases of gender-based violence naturally increase all over the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I believe that people can work together. You know, in a peaceful Gambia to ensure that we get it. I will I'll come. To, I'll come to the pandemic, but I want to come to you, uh, Alimato. So the cyberbullying. Cyberbullying um, is so is so much on the rise right now, and you guys are doing a lot of advocacy. Uh, you you know sensitization. How is this affecting your work? Because we have seen a lot of feminists, a lot of uh, you know activists coming out and supporting, uh, coming reporting cases. And once they report cases, they are bullied. And now what we have seen is people just keeping to themselves because they are scared that once they come out and talk about their stories, either they expose the confidentiality, I'll come to learning about that, or they are bullied on social media. Once that happens, how does that affect your job of making sure people know about this issue? In fact, like, like um, Mr. Kungle said, it's about information. Mm. I just said uh, when I was saying that I think the issue about sexual and gender-based violence it's a gender dynamic, and that's why we need to start from the family level. All the issues, even the bullying you're talking about, is just like about dominance of women. Mm. Even if it is true that my story is true, who are you to say it there? You better keep quiet, you're yeah. only a woman, and you're supposed to be here. Yeah. That's the norm. So the main um, power we have currently is information. Mm. Going out there and saying, even if you bully it, it is your right to talk about being violated. Mm -hmm. You need to come out. And the reporting he's saying, he's right in saying that it's anybody who is nearest you that you think that can support you to report the case. You can talk to the person. It could be your mom. It could be your brother. It could be a neighbor. It could be the head of your compound. It could be the head of your cabillo. It could be the village development committee. It could be an, an alcalo. As far as the person have been sensitized, and that is why the information should go down right to the community. Let's get these community structures and reorient them on the issues of um, gender norms. It should shift. Honorable Minister said that there are social norms. Mm -hmm. But if we have social norms that are harmful, we need to go away with them yeah. and keep the social norms that are good. And a big social norm that we term a good one is this... Um, culture of silence we, 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 we call maslaha in this Gambia, mm -hmm. or the honor of the family versus the right of the one being violated. So we need to look at the family unit and tell them an honor that will destroy an individual or a community is not a good honor. It's not a good norm. We should go away from it and look at the honor that will bring um, good health, bring good citizen, mm -hmm. bring 
um, good uh, passing in terms of health, getting your reproduct uh, reproductive rights, or getting economic empowerment, or getting the right education. A girl child who is from being timid, even if you are sexually violated, to live positively, to become one day the minister or the director of this country. Mm -hmm. Because we have supported the person to go out seeing herself as being a victim, to being a survivor. And who can do that? It's the people that are um, um, surrounding her. Mr. Kunle just said, if your family leaves you, the community leaves you, the country leaves you, your friends leaves you, so what are you there to live for? You would rather go in for suicide. He just told you there is a lot of fem femicide maybe outside the Gambia. But if you can look at also the trend, there is an increasing rate mm. of suicidal thoughts in this country that we don't used to have. Do we ask ourselves, most of the time we say, okay, it's um, substance abuse. But do we know what is the cause of the substance abuse? Mm. Some of the substance abuse that are happening in this country is as a result of gender-based violence mm -hmm, yeah. that you are not able to report you are not supposed to even have somebody to talk to about because you're told if you talk to someone um, you're a liar yeah. if you talk to someone it means that you are not a woman the gender norm in this country is that yeah. or in the entire Africa is that women should bear yeah. pain and the pain is not only physical pain you bear psychological pain you bear economical pain you bear, you bear all kinds of pain in that that is what you expect to do. So me as a woman coming out to say, for example, I was going to work and I was raped. Um, the, the dominance in the country, whether if, even you will find that some women even would also be part of the bu bullying. bullying. They will yeah. say, this is, you are a woman, why do you have to report this? Yeah. So that is why Ms., Mr. Kumli's um, issue on information sharing is what will empower the communities to able to say yes. Even the worst case scenario that I am a sexual worker as a woman, I should not be violated. Nobody should violate me yeah. as a woman. Either it is harassment or beating or whatnot. Or even denying me of employment because I am a woman. Yeah. Because even that is a, a, is a gender based violence. Mm -hmm. We are all calling for girl education. Yes, we are all seeing young women coming act activists. If you stand at the university, you look at the number of girls that go in and out, you realize that the gap in terms of education mm -hmm. would change. Yeah. But where would we be in terms of also closing the gender inequality when you look at their right to employment as a woman? Not looking that they are a young girl. They go out BSc, BSc. They want to apply for um, a, a position of a director. Yeah. And they all have equal opportunities and they have the, the skills and whatnot. What would the gender norm would be? Let's take the man. Because yeah. when you have a female director, she's going to bully us. Mm. This is it. Yeah. And that's why they call all uh, uh, activists now who gender-based violence that we are feminists. Mm. No, we are not feminists. Yeah. It's just that the gap is too wide on the women's side. And we need to bring that. We are also aware that there are few men that are also um, victims of gender-based violence. But we want to close that gap. When we close the inequality gap, when it comes to employment opportunities and the rest, then we will now look at other opportunities. Because even where you are a director as a woman, you will see that even among your colleagues, you are bullied when it comes to some issues, um, um, uh, responsibilities and rules and, 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 and whatnot. At the end, they will say, after all, what are you? You are only a woman. Yeah. So that is why what he said is about giving out the right information, right at the tender age or right at the community level. Let them realize that some of these issues we need to talk about them. How do you raise your kids, a boy and a girl in your compound? Yeah. Doing house chairs, respecting one another in the household. They grow like that. They respect each other as siblings. They respect each other as uh, brothers and sisters. When they go out, they respect each other as friends when it comes to the opposite sex. And as they grow old, they respect one another in their relationship. And we expect if they grow like um, the Honorable Minister was saying, we focus on the adolescents and the youth to bring them up to be responsible adults tomorrow. Because they have seen that at the house level, there is equality. But currently, the gender norm is even at the house level, there is no equality when you are bringing up your child. Favoritism is given when it comes to certain functions in the house to a boy yeah. uh, rather than a girl. So right at the start, that's how they grow. The, the boy is told that you are the man, you have power over, even if he's the younger one. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how they grow. Yeah. And also, if we want uh, gender-based violence to reduce, we also need to look at the couple. Mm. If a couple is always fighting, quarreling in the house, yeah. the children would learn that, they would think that is the norm. Yeah. 
And when they go out, they fight with their friends. When they get relationship, they fight with their relationship. When they get married, they beat their wives or their husbands. Because for them, violence is norm in the compound. They see mother and father fighting. It's the norm. So we, when we want to, we really need to go down there. So for us as an organization, we are aware of the challenges and we are ready for the bullying. bullying. Like, like we say, sometimes you go out and say, oh, these are the people who are talking about yeah. gender-based violence when they themselves are being violated in their houses. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. We could be. Yeah. But we do not want others to be violated. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we need to continue. We are victims. We are survivors. But we don't want other people to be survivors. Therefore, we continue to advocacy. We hope that one day, if it is 100 people, we start with getting one. You said you have seen him transform. We have all seen so many of us transform in one way or the other. And we hope those are the window of opportunity. At a time, we will get more people and the fight would be easier and lesser in time of struggle in terms of then you will see it's just like five years ago um few people dare to come out and say i'm violated mm -hmm. well you can see now people are coming out in the media in the television in the social media talking yeah. even though they are being bullied but the, the struggle continues. continues and we have seen people now come into the hospital more and even to them like he said mm -hmm. before you would not even with all the culture of silence and what they will not there but now they are sneaking now the issue is they will tell you if i come and report please don't tell that i am the one who report and my 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 answer to them is always to say we do not need your name give us the the address where it is happening we will investigate and like she said we are also popularizing the 1313 report give us the location and we'll investigate remain anonymous uh, anonymous because currently we know that the issue of the culture of silence they will turn away that bad person but we need to start from somewhere and i hope like he said i'm also op optimistic that um in the in the near future we'll be able to confidently come out and talk about the issues and that way it will be more we talk about it the more they will yeah. go down but so if we do not it they will not go down. so you 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 did uh, touch on something very important the communities um how we raise our kids at home um we have seen that when people grow in relationships sometimes uh, they will tell you oh but you are in a relationship yeah. where, where do we draw the line when a woman says no when a woman says stops it should stop when you go beyond that that is violation but people will tell you, oh no boyfriend they're in a relationship but you can violate can you violate somebody when you're in a relationship with them is that possible because this is what we believe in is that possible very possible sure. but it comes back to what uh, the honorable minister said it's a social norm mm. yeah she said um in her conversation saying that their investigation in case of a physical violence where they are beaten yeah. and hurt she think that it might be um a good evidence even if they do not have witnesses. Yeah. But the social norm also is that you do not re report your spouse. Yeah. Or your, yeah, your spouse. Mm -hmm. You do not report them even if they beat them. In the health sector, we do work with um, women. Sometimes you would examine the woman and you really see that these are marks of being beaten. But because of the same gender norm or the social norm, the person will tell you, I hit my head or I fell down. Yeah? So if the index would not tell you, how would you be able to go forward? Mm -hmm. And that is why I said that culture of silence need to break before people come. We need women need to know that it is their right to report when they are violated. He said the study said sixty percent of women who are beaten are beaten in this country. Mm -hmm. It is true. And the same study, if one of the study also is saying that um, women who have been asked this question, why do men beat you? They said it's a sign of love. Yes. Yeah, because they beat you when you have done something right. So in rectifying you, they beat you up. So that's why I said for me, um, it's more of a social norm. And the Honorable Minister already said that they also mix it with religion. But even in the same religion that they are saying, you, ha you can beat your wife. But they didn't say you should hurt her. There is a way that you should beat. And if that is the beating that everybody is saying, nobody would be hurt. But you know, um, human beings interpret things, interpret things the way it suits them. Mm -hmm. So over time, it has been centuries that it has been put, inculcated into our sub mind since we were children that we should be obedient, we should be submissive. Okay? So now here comes gender based violence coming and saying, no, if your uh, man hits you, you should report. So you are removing the, what, the submission. So that is why you and I, who are advocates, we really need to talk.
continue to talk in and continue to some of them when you talk to them they will tell you oh i never knew that this was a violent mm -hmm. even the men yes. yes they do not know they do yes. not appreciate mm -hmm. and for me the advocacy is not only on the women we should also target men yeah, yeah. Yeah, if we want to have solution, we need to target men. Yeah. We have successfully engaged some um, religious leaders in in the regions, and we were surprised when we talked to them about some certain issues. After the discussion, most of them came out. Mm -hmm. Almost eighty percent came out and plainly said, um, "We we never knew that these were violences, and we never knew the consequences of this. That is what is affecting our marriages, and we are going to use our uh, religious sermons to talk about it." So information is power and that information needs to go out from all of us. And you can start from a small way. If you do not reach the people at the grassroots, start with your family. You and your husband. Mm -hmm. How do you discuss sexuality? We engage in it but we don't discuss it. How do you as a couple or as a parent talk to your children about that? You're talking about beating, they do not know that it is harassment. Do they even know their body parts to start with? If they do not know their body parts, would they know if you touch me on the breath, I should say no, stop. Yeah. We do not. As parents, we talk to them in idioms. And that makes them vulnerable as they grow. So that is why I said for me, we should start from that level. Yes. Tackle tuck, the couple. Mm -hmm. Tackle the community. Then you get your younger generation because they are our window of hope. Yes. They will be able to have a way forward. But apart from that, you and I... 16 days of activism, I said in the office, for me, 16 days of activism is just um, a period that we want everybody. For example, you're saying Orange the World, we're saying Orange the Gambia. Mm -hmm. We want everybody at every corner to listen and hear something about SGVB. But I personally, as an advocate or as an NGO, I wanted to go beyond that, yeah. beyond the 16 days period, so that we sustain the gains. Mm -hmm. If not, after the 16 days of um, activism, everything dies out yeah. until next year. And you start saying, like they would say, oh, for a long time we have not seen you. We even forgot about uh, sexual and gender-based violence. So together, in our different levels, if you are at the police, if I am at the hospital, if you are at the media, if somebody is at the, uh, at the, at the farm, mm -hmm. if somebody at, is at the courthouse, Together, how can we all talk about it at all levels and sustain it? That is the only way we'll be able to reduce it. If not, all of us are, are victims. We are all potential victims. Yes. Thank That's you. True. That's true. Finally, before we go, Piero, uh, confidentiality is very important sure. in, in tackling uh, survivors. So how are victims protected when, it, you know, when they come to the police station? What is the scenario of one coming to report a case at the station? How do you handle them? Very well. Um, the Gambia Police Force, especially at our police station levels, um, mm -hmm. we have a reporting system where if individuals come, they report to the police station charge office. At mm -hmm. this point in time, we, um, we, we wouldn't know what is the report about because mm -hmm. ordinarily everybody comes to the charge office and report. Um, but what we are trying to do is, which is the reason why we are attaching gender and child welfare officers to police station, is always to be aware of um, the reports that are coming in on the decks. If they know this is something to do with gender-based violence, especially if it requires some degree of confidentiality, right from the counter, they should be able to. That's why we create special offices for um, um, personnel of the gender and child welfare unit. So the moment they understand that this is to do with gender-based violence and there is high degree of um, confidentiality that is required, then they should be able to ordinarily report and record, document the case, but they will deal with it in the office at the um, gender and child welfare unit, which is more secure in terms of um, confidentiality and uh, interaction between the officers because um, um, ordinarily you will find uh, uniform officers on the decks but with somebody who is not in uniform which is also the reason why they are not uniform officers um, the interaction will be much easier and so they will be able to um, extract the information from the um, survivor or victim and then that forms the basis also for the investigation of that case so globally, um, we know we have seen um, the rise in cases on GVV um, in America and Europe because of the, the recent pandemic, the COVID-19. And how, why do you think it's important to invest heavily now in the fight against GVV? And what is the uh, situation in the Gambia? Okay, thank you so much. So it's important, and I noted that we've been 
talking, we've done, I really, I mean, during this panel, there's so much passion. Yeah. Uh, but it's important to also be clear that, I mean, we're not painting men as, you know, as, yes. as demons. Yeah. No. You know, and Alima said it very rightly that, you know, people, you know, it's about what you've been trained to be, right? Yeah. What society has trained you, and it's all over the world. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that what is happening in the Gambia is not novel in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. Until recently, even in America, where we all look up to for this, it was diff it's still difficult for women to talk about these things. Yeah. You saw Harvey Weinstein's case. Mm -hmm. People who have been violated 20 years, yeah. they, they are just summoning up the courage to speak about it. And yeah. so many yeah. will still not talk about it. Yeah. So it's, it's just to, to, to situate it in that way. Yeah. Now, when you speak about COVID specifically, mm. the peculiarities of actions that COVID has forced on the community and the society, mm -hmm. you know, gives a viral room for escalation of gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. And that's what I said. So for example, let's just look at how COVID has ravaged the economies of the world. Yeah. You know, you know, men, we do like this yeah. and go out, we want to bring fist money. <laughs> yeah. he, will, he will not tell you the stress mm -hmm. he's facing here, here. Yeah. Then the day the woman just asked three times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the woman has three times where the man is not in the in the mood. Mm. You, just, you know, it just gets, it can get violent. Yeah. Now, also, research has shown that a lot of relationships, you know, have their own coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. The coping mechanism might also include going out to work. Yeah. You know, and spending some time learning with people, go to meet your mentor, talk to somebody who tells you, calm down, you guys are just going through this process now. But when people have to, you know, be in sometimes a close space, depending on what they're doing, for endless times, carrying frustrations. Many have lost their jobs during that time. You know, carrying frustrations. So a lot of women are actually in the same confined space with their abusers mm -hmm. during COVID-19. And that's what led to the escalation. So um, the only way that rightly said it, that we have economic, um, uh, economic violence and those mm -hmm. kind of things. So yeah. when those things come, People react in different ways, we argue, and so many things come. So those are COVID peculiar mm -hmm. issues. So it's not like this gender violence did not exist, but COVID exacerbated, it, yeah. you know, you know, gender gender violence and also gave more clarity to it. However, I think it, it also gave us an opportunity mm -hmm. to really see things that we were not seeing before. Okay. You know, oftentimes there's what they call the police. I'm not a police officer, but I'm a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes they, they call something general criminality. Okay. So if it's as if, if maybe we start picking pocket now, it's the big thing in the Gambia, the police is fighting. But when the whole community is picking pocket and, <laughs> and, the, and yeah. the other side, yeah. the police do not look at mm -hmm. picking pocket as a big deal anymore. Yeah. They move to more, mm -hmm. more serious we'll things. So yeah, in, in, in sociology, it's called general criminality. Yeah. No, so general based violence, I think at some point, mm -hmm. you know, we became a little complacent. And, they, and I talk for all of us yeah. at some point, but I think COVID also gave us a jolt mm -hmm. because we did a, a quick um, study with the office of the minister. And, you know, the kind of thing, just asking people in communities, you know, also, you know, brought out this issue. Female genital mutilation, which we have not spoken about. Yeah. The closure of schools, mm -hmm. you know, the closure of schools, these few men that carry people to one place, I don't know, Minister can tell it, tell it better. And yeah. I said, you know, they was no nobody was doing anything. Yeah. The girl wasn't busy, the mother wasn't busy. It, it gave time for things that they were not considering before, you know, to then do child marriage, yeah. which exposes girls to violence. Mm -hmm. In fact, in fact, anybody who you marry under 18, you're already exposed, you're already put in a violent situation, mm -hmm. yeah. according to the laws of the Gambia. Yeah. It's not only Adeni is saying it. Mm -hmm. you know, according to the laws of the Gambia, is already, you know, they're exposed to violence. But you see that closure of schools, closure of there are many communities that are vulnerable, they move them to this, you know, to these things. And I'm sure that the data will be seen yeah. by next year of this year might not be too kind. Okay. But what it does is that I'm happy that we were able to rally around quickly with the leadership of the Ministry of um, Women, Children and Social Welfare, development partners, you know, the police and, you know, great um, uh, NGOs like NGBV, you know, to really begin to react to this thing. And that's what gave us the opportunity
to launch the first GBV helpline in Gambia, yeah. which is the 133, which I'm proud to say we are all working on yeah. using as the, as the only one. We are all supporting it. We are, we are moving around it. The first shelter mm -hmm. and a women's space, as it's currently known, um, the ministers spoke about the location. Uh, oftentimes, yeah, uh, which, which is good, but for women to, to, to converge. By the end of this year, we'll be handing over to the ministry supporting, like the minister said, a, a shelter within the Bakote um, um, children shelter, shelter, specifically dedicated to women, where they can be if they need an overnight stay, they can be. And you know, we need to begin to save people. We're talking about lives. Yeah. You know, it's not so. So, what I think in the last, honestly, in the last seven months, we have moved faster than we moved. You know, yeah. I'll be honest. You yeah. know, to be, I'll be honest for you know for 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 a while. And because we all got up, the partnership, including the, the, the police for the judiciary, moved forward, you know, to deliver for the Gambia. And I'm hopeful that we will sustain these actions and this act. I just call on the community yeah. to join us, you know, you know to, to deliver the best for the women and the children of the Gambia. Thank you, Honorable. I think he just reminded about FB, me about F, FGM, yeah. and I do remember, you know, former government there was a ban on FGM. But you know, now you talk to the, my grandmother in the village, you tell, oh, my FGM loyalty is not this new government. People tend to take laws for, for you know, like I this was a, a government, and now we have seen people practicing it here. Is government making sure these things are implemented to the ladder? Um, just as Kule had, just, um, had said, mm -hmm. um, because, because of COVID, people spend longer times together. Yeah. That has never been the norm in the Gambia. Yeah. And uh, it was, it, it became a recipe mm -hmm. for violence against women and yeah. girls. Mm -hmm. It also became a violence um, for FGM, uh, also child marriage. For child marriage, especially where um, parents of a girl were approached and they rejected the, the, the suitor because the girl is going to school. Now that she's at school at home and they don't know where school will ever open again. Mm -hmm. And especially when the suitor is a rich person in court. So they quickly send off the girl in marriage. And that's another form of gender violence, as Kule has said. Mm -hmm. And it has devastating consequences for the girl child. And uh, when it comes to FGM, yes, uh, there is a law in place. Once a law, always a law. Mm -hmm. Yes. The law came into being um, in November 2015, and it is still a law. Yeah. But you also remember, unless someone reports, yeah. You'll be able to know whether there is a case of FGM taking place in a particular community or, or in a particular ward. So we are still right on evidence. Um, just as, as Lamont has said, the witnesses are very important here. For FGM, you don't even have to disclose your identity. Just make a call and let us know that FGM is taking place in a particular place in Seraconda and just give us the right description. Then people can, we can just send people there to um, arrest those who are involved. But unless we are informed. There's nothing one can do. Mm -hmm. It's not for these laws. This is the problem with, 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 with implementing the laws. Unless you, uh, you report, it will be difficult. And again, sometimes, even when you report, um, um, this is based on one thing. Yeah. The police officers are also part of a community mm -hmm. and they're part of the culture. Yeah. And so this is the reason why there is more need for more sensitization and, and training. Because uh, the police officer that you report to is part of the community. Mm -hmm. And he or she will find it difficult to go and arrest members of his or her own community. So this is why it's also very important for them to be further trained. I know that at the Attorney General's Chambers, a gender unit was uh, established in 2017. And uh, uh, one of the reasons why it has been established is for them to be able to um, uh, 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 conduct arrest and prosecution. Mm -hmm. The members comprise of um, uh, lawyers, uh, police officers, social workers. Yeah, but then even with that, unless cases are reported, mm -hmm. it will be different for them to take action. Yeah. And uh, when a report case is reported, um, you don't, as I mentioned, you don't have to discuss your identity. But for me, reporting of cases is, is, is important when it comes to FGM. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 through observation also, we can suspect that FGM is taking place in a particular area. And then you can uh, cunningly do your investigations and be able to identify whether FGM has taken place or is about to take place. And then you can intervene. But I want to say that once a law is always a law, if a case of FGM is reported, 
the necessary actions will be taken as per the law. I know the I know the the Gambia government. I know the you're working closely with UN agencies, UNFP, and other agencies, mm -hmm. and to provide resources, capacity, and all the necessary support to to eradicate harmful practices in the country. But what importance is government attaching to this as well as as its own? And right now, the the, the, the budget is table at the National Assembly. I know just the creation of the Women's Affairs Ministry is is huge, the Women's and Children's Affairs Unit, but how much resources is available for the operation and help to help um, these uh, harmful practices to eradicate? How, what resources? We don't have to only rely on the donor partners. What are we doing ourselves? That's, a, that's an important question because the point is donors come and go. Yeah. Government should be seen supporting programs. That is what is sustainable. Yeah. We can't rely on donors 100%. Mm -hmm. um, we have seen um, funding our own programs. Um, yes, the budget is being um, done. It's still not finalized yet. Yeah, yeah. And then some of our programs are being costed in, in, in the budget. Mm. But as I have been saying, I, I, I have said earlier, mm. um, during one of my uh, interactions with one or two of my colleagues, I said um, we should now move to gender and program budgeting. Mm. Yes. A lot have been said about it, um, but um, the uh, implementation uh, is not taking place as required. There's some implementation, of course, but not as required. So this is the reason why um, 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 my ministry will advocate for gender and program budgeting. So that in future budgets, yeah. um, a lot of our programs are costed. Because uh, if we cost it, we own the programs. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that uh, also brings in the, the issue of ownership. ownership. So whatever we get from donors, we just be there to complement what, what, what we have. But for me, um, uh, the onus is on government to support its own programs. And also, of course, get support, um, uh, get uh, uh, complimentary support from donors. Uh, yes. Yeah. Alimo, to finally, what's your message to especially those in the communities, the culture of silence, the, the, the Maslaha syndrome? What's your message to people who think, yes, we should just push this under the carpet, we should not talk about it, you know, it's a family, friend, so let's forget about it. What's your message to those people? For me, it's to rewrite those gender norms. If there is any gender norms that it's a culture of silence that bring harm to an individual or violate someone, mm -hmm. that gender norm should be rebuilt. Yeah. And bring a norm that would bring free of violence to everybody. Therefore, we need to break that culture of silence and start talking about the right of individuals, not the honor of the family. If we do that, we will be able to break the culture of child silence and we'll also be able to groom our young ones to go away from that timidity that you and I have about not talking about things that harm them and then suppress it in them, growing with them that will cause um, a violence later in their life, either through their reproductive life or through their sexual life. That way we will be able to have norms that will accommodate dialogue. And I think another big problem is lack of dialogue. Mm. Because of the culture of silence, you said it in Mandinka, imunya, imunya, imunya. Mm -hmm. There is no discussion between even husband and wife. Yeah. The husband says and the woman does. That's all. But if you dialogue, we call it kacha in Mandinka, mm -hmm. watan, mm -hmm. hmm? yeotere in fula. Yeah. If we bring that between husband and wife, between a mother and a child, between a father and a child, then we will go in a long way in reducing gender-based violence. Without that, they will go ahead because parents believe that children should fear them. But the gender rewriting the gender norm is not that they should fear them. They should love them. In loving someone, we need to tell them the good and the bad. Let them be aware. But saying that when they know the good and the bad at an early stage, it makes them to be bad people in the future. It's not like that. So we should go away in that issue of fearing your parent and loving your parent or your parent loving you, caring, sharing. We should be able to. I always say this in my talks when I'm dealing with a um, service provider. I say the worst case scenario is your child going out there and killing someone outside. He should be confident enough to come and say, Baba will be a molefa. Mm -hmm. But that dialogue is not between a, a, a father and a child. They cannot come and say, uh, Daddy or Mommy, this is what I did out there. Because we believe that if I do bad and report it to their mom, I'll be reprimanded. Yeah. That should go away. Tell me, then we will know together how to be able to solve that problem. Yeah. If we as parents can do that for our children, 
then we will be able to help them to become responsible adults, young adults later in the future. Very important. Um, so, Piero, final message. How, how, uh, what assurance can you give us that when we visit any police station, we will be taken care of, we will be protected, and our confidentiality will not be blown out? I want to give specific um, examples to even us, the media, when we report on these cases. We ident some, some of the ways we report, I do know we had a training with um, the Paradise Foundation recently, and it was very helpful because what we have seen is you know when media uh, operatives do a story about uh -huh. gender-based violence the way yeah. um, the stories are yes. written how the victims are portrayed yes, yes. it's Better, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's the report the reporting already, yeah the report know, only really tells you yeah. if you say fa yeah. and you name the street and you name just give all the description obviously we will know who you're talking about mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. these are things that we also have a role to play and we are very helpful we are very grateful that paradise foundation through your support are able to um, create this training for media operatives and i think i hope it will help um, a lot of us in the media field to be able to do report in this case but yes thank you very much Fatu. and <coughs> i just want to start by saying the Gambia police force want to um, um, send a message a very strong message to the general public especially to, for people to understand that um, gender-based violence is a crime and once it is committed the police will not um, 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 uh, will not trivialize that matter we will deal with it accordingly and so anybody who is out there thinking you can perpetrate violence against women and children or girls and get away with it we are telling you it is not going to work but then also if you look at the partnership, the uh, way we are working together with um, partners like the UNFPA, the Paradise Foundation, the Ministry and the Network, that also shows you how um, the interest and also the fact that the police is definitely taking a tough stand in uh, dealing with these situations because we know that it has to be some form of holistic approach to dealing with the situation and which is why um, we are working with all the partners to ensure that um, um, we are able to um, put up the necessary structures even within the police force itself then um, to roll it out to the community. And the other thing I want to tell the communities is the fact you mentioned something about the reporting. And so um, I want to also add voice to the popularization of the 1313 number, mm -hmm. uh, which is in existence at the Paradise Foundation, that we are all partnering within this. Um, on the background, when you report 1313, the Paradise Foundation also work with us directly. Mm -hmm. If the case is a, a crime-related matter, it does not necessarily uh, matter if you had gone to the police initially or not. But once you call the 1313 and explain your situation, the, uh, they will take note of this. And if it is to do with crime, the police will automatically be informed. And before you know, the police would have been there to deal with this situation. Uh, Kule, well, what's your final message? Um, one thing that we've realized is that the human being is one indivisible element. Mm. If you're dealing with a woman and there's an issue, it's important that we don't work in, in different in different loose manner it's yeah. better to come together mm -hmm. and have a conversation and say okay what is your role in doing that and i really thank the ministry for being able to set up a coordination mechanism where we have these conversations and to work together so when you say what what are we doing i, I would just say what we're doing mm -hmm. it focuses on the four like i said earlier the four uh the theme of this year yeah. we provide funding we will continue to provide funding to the best of our abilities to um uh to gbv uh issues because one of our strategic outputs or outcome three we have just three globally family planning um gender-based violence and maternal health because and they are all linked mm -hmm. you know because women gender-based violence leads to death of women yeah mm -hmm. they die in the hospital so mm -hmm. they are all linked. In, 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 interlinked someday we'll have another Let opportunity to, yeah. to to dive into that so but we have a mandate from member state of united nations the 192 to work to lead the effort to end all forms of gender-based violence mm -hmm. by 2030 it sounds like a tall order. Yep. You know, it sounds like a tall order. <laughs> At some point, we wanted to do it before 2015 with the MDGs, but this is a sustainable development goal. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a tall order, but we are committed to continue to do this. And like I said, it focuses on three cardinal things that we work on in the Gambia. It's advocacy. We need to talk. Yeah. We need to get everybody to talk. We need to get the minister to talk. Yeah. We want the president to say, no, stop 
violating yeah. my women. I'm the father of the nation. Yeah. He was firstly to say that we because these our leaders, we respect yeah. them, we listen to them. Yeah. We need the our colonels, the governors, you know, the mayors to join this conversation and say, no, you cannot be doing this. Alima uh, spoke about uh, about offices, the mm -hmm. ILO convention. Yeah. One of the ways we were able to tackle HIV was that every office had a workplace policy on HIV. Mm -hmm. So if you have a workplace policy on gender-based violence, right. meaning that if I hear yeah. that you touch your wife, mm -hmm. you are losing your job, job. Yep. or something like that, maybe it will make someone think think, oh, yes. think, yep. think otherwise. Mm -hmm. So so that is policy and advocacy. And that also includes advocating for the National Assembly, the exec to allocate money to issues of, of women. Mm -hmm. it, it, it comes from economic empowerment. I know the government has the Women Enterprise Fund now because some of these violence are also based on the fact that people feel helpless to yeah. do to do anything. I'm not sure that if you have, you know, I'm yeah. not trying to say people should not, mm -hmm. people should not listen when they have jobs and everything. Yeah. But your economic empowerment also earns some kind of respect. I yeah. want to, I want to believe that, yeah. you know. So, and I think those are there. So that's the policy and advocacy issue, which includes funding. The care part I've already spoken about. We will continue to work with the health facility. It is important. Too many women go for so long carrying the scars and brunt of it that they don't even know. Yeah. You say, you try to, you, it's an American term, the angry black woman. Yep. That is in America. Yep. You, you, you try to modify it. Yep. But you know, people also react in different it ways. Is, yeah. it, it will affect productivity, it will affect work, mm -hmm. it will affect so many things. Until recently, we also did not focus on mental health. You know, that's also something COVID helped us to, to really focus on. We, the UNFPA leads the the response with the Ministry of Health on mental health. So we're able to link it with our GBV practice and we have mental health and psychosocial support. In fact, there's even online counseling for women now who may need to just talk, you know, to talk to get the, that kind of help. So that is a care, uh, a, a care point and everything. And the response, I don't want to go back to the police and justice system. We need to do more in that area. I know the PRO is there. We all know that it's an issue, but we need to do more in that area. And one of the considerations that we're learning from other countries is that maybe it's time to begin to consider having special courts for gender-based violence. Yes. Where yes. the yes. privacy yes. can mm -hmm. be maintained. Yes. Yep. Because mm -hmm. if you bring a case to open court, mm -hmm. I used to be a trial lawyer. Everybody sits there. You call a case, you call a case. You yep. But maybe if we know that there are four courts sitting in different parts that address these cases, the lawyers, the judges and magistrates are well trained, trained. to on the confidentiality on, on, on this issue because it's, it requires it. it I do not want to call him. A judge called me last week and said, Kunle, you guys have a lot of work to do. Yeah. Because what I'm saying in my court, I'm looking at it, you know, there's so it's just so much that he knew that this person, you know, he had a feeling that it's possible that this happened, but he knew that this person will also work Work free. free. Yep. So these are the kind of things that we need to work that with the attorney general's team. Mm -hmm. And I'm counting on the minister for the leadership yeah. of that kind of engagement from the attorney general's team back to the to the CJ to the chief justice. We need to really consider the uh, establishment of special courts to deal with gender-based violence, where confidentiality is maintained. Only the people that should be there are and there, yeah. and we can clearly address these issues. So that is the the point, and we will continue to work in this way. Yeah. Advocacy is continuous. Communication is continuous. We will continue to do it. Today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister, final message. Thank you very much. And to start with, I want to, I concur with Kule. We need special cause of gender based violence. Yeah. And this is something that um, we are discussing amongst ourselves. And right. we'll take it up with the other years chambers. Um, in conclusion, my final words um, will be uh, gender based violence is everybody's business to eliminate. Mm -hmm. And uh, it starts from the home, to, to the community, yeah. to, to national level. I want to say that um, the talking will continue, the advocacy will continue, the socialization will continue, because we need the required attitude, attitude and behavior changes for us to be able to reduce and eventually eliminate again this violence. So in that case, I want to say that it is everybody's business. We need to educate ourselves, educate our families, our communities, and everybody at the level of the country.
I don't live in the country. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister Alamin, Alimatu, and Kule. And to you guys watching, uh, this conversation should not stop here. It should go down to the community levels, to the parents, the husbands, even, you know, the partners. Most of the time is we go home, we go to sleep, there's no conversation. Just like Alimatu said, once there's no conversation, then there's no understanding. And this is what brings all these problems at home. I uh, want to thank you all, and I hope you enjoy the show. Good night to you. Have you run out of cash power? Do you want to transfer funds to your family? Or do you want salary advance without coming to the bank? Your banking services have just been brought to you on your mobile phone. Download and install from your App Store or Google Play Trust Bank's mobile app. Simply search for TBL Mobile App and follow the instructions. You can access the following services. Funds transfer, cash power purchase, Forex rates inquiries, mobile airtime top up, mini statement, balance inquiry, TBL app is the only app that allows you to take salary advance and many more. You can also interact with your customers using our USSD code by dialing star 533 hash. At Trust Bank, we bring innovation that is useful to you, our valued customer. With our mobile app and USSD, Banking is at your fingertips. Trust Bank Limited. Proudly Gambian. Better and stronger as the sole ground operator at the Banjul International Airport. With an expansion in travel services, customers are assured of GIA's capacity to cater for all their travel needs, provided by professional, experienced and ever-smiling staff. GIA's hatch package and services by far the best in the country give the customers the opportunity for a memorable hatch experience. For a more efficient cargo services, GIA means business as it launches its new multi-million dollar ultra-modern cargo complex to revitalize and stimulate air transport. GIA, the pride of the Gambia. Je <laughs>